<laughs> well, welcome, guys. And uh, whilst we get the yes, and we have the online audience. Uh, hello, everybody who's patching in from all over the world online. It's good to have you with us as people uh, file in from the back. Welcome, everybody. Um, so we are here on the last day of May to talk about public speaking. And oddly, by the way, for those of you who don't know, my name is Fred Rode. I'm the, <laughs> the founder and CEO of, uh, of Heavy Chef. Uh, and, uh, and I'm actually feeling a little bit nervous tonight about speaking because it's so weird. I have, first of all, I've spoken on stage, I would say comfortably a few hundred times. And, uh, and tonight I'm sharing the stage and the virtual stage with two freaking world champions. So no pressure. I hope I'm doing okay so far. Um, but just, just first of all, just a, a quick introduction to, um, to Heavy Chef and, um, and, and what, it, what it is that we actually do. We're not a cooking show, for those of you who are wondering, you, you did potentially stumble in here thinking you'd get food and, and, uh, and treats. That's not going to happen. Uh, we are going to get a, a recipe, a world-class recipe on how to speak in public. Hopefully, we, uh, it'll, it'll be a better masterclass than I'm going to be able to give you. Um, but the, the whole purpose of Heavy Chef is, is literally based around the core belief that we have in that we believe that entrepreneurs can change the world for the better. So if you're thinking of all the challenges that we face in this country and uh, particularly on this continent, as well as around the world, I mean, I think if you look at uh, uh, hotspots and hubs, entrepreneur hubs around the world, it's entrepreneurs that really affect change more efficiently and faster than anybody else. So. It's, uh, it's that belief that we coalesce all the learning uh, that we provide and we aim to inspire people essentially to start new projects and then empower them through the, uh, the, um, the lessons and the recipes and the events, the community sessions, the learning programs that we, we host to succeed. Um, we also, it would be remiss of me not to mention our partners that have supported us along the way. We've been around now for a couple of years, and from the outset, um, we've been supported by just an unbelievable portfolio of partners who align with this belief around entrepreneurship and the power of, uh, of starting projects and, and empowerment. Uh, particularly Payfast, uh, some of whom are here tonight. Look, mine, Crystal, Terry, I see you guys. Uh, welcome. And, uh, and also the Zero crew, uh, who've also supported us right from the beginning. Um, we have, um, we've also got the Eclipse team here tonight. Uh, Steve, Jackie, uh, there we go, right up front, there we go. And new member, Shahid, welcome, sir, good to see you. And, uh, and we also, I just want to give a shout out to, to our other partners, uh, Capitalize, Whipping the Cat, Digital Planet, uh, HP, uh, We Grow SA, Workshop 17, Baxberg. Uh, I'll talk about the prize tonight as well involving Baxberg. So Fruit, Good Leaf, Parcel Ninja, um, Creed Living, and sadly they couldn't be here tonight, um, which, which is usually the crew they come here in force. But... Uh, Howler, Black Magic, SSIO, the team backstage, pulling all the strings and twiddling the knobs, uh, making the magic happen. Um, and, uh, and we do have a prize for tonight. So this is for uh, a particular individual in the, in the audience tonight, online or in the physical audience. So the prize will be awarded to the best question of the evening fielded to our two illustrious guests, uh, Mark and Verity. So uh, we've got a team of actuaries in the back um, <laughs> that are going to be pouring through the comments online and the questions. Uh, and then uh, between Zhuzha and Brian and Moabs, we're going to have a winner. So if you disagree with the selection, you can take it up with them. I'm just going to respond to their message at the end of it. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so please f uh, get ready to, to field your question. This is your opportunity to engage with uh, two of the best public speakers in the world, no pressure, Mark and Verity. Um, and uh, by the way, just to give that some context, uh, and just to, to uh, I think, outline it, because I joke around a little bit, but I want to just give, 
first of all, I mean, our two speakers tonight, just to, to kind of put it into, into stark relief, the Toastmasters event is uh, an international, uh, it's an international award, right? It's been run for over 80 years, every single year, right? Um, I believe last year was over 35,000 entries from 149 countries. Uh, and it's basically, it's seven months, right? In order to get part, part, through 35,000 entries um, to get to one winner, right? And, uh, and essentially, um, they get to eight finalists who then have to deliver a brand new speech, which has never been delivered before. Um, and up until last year, and this is the, the good bit for, for us in the audience, no one had ever won from Africa in 80 years. And so we have the first winner, and only I think the sixth or fifth female woman ever to win this, this award. So can we give it another? <laughs> And I, I'm, I'm very, very, very proud to, to call Verity my friend. And it's such an honor to have you here on stage uh, once again, because uh, just a little bit of side trivia for those who have been following Heavy Chef. Uh, Verity was our first ever speaker at Heavy Chef. So, um, so welcome back. In a kitchen. In a kitchen. <laughs> and there was only six <laughs> people in the audience. From <laughs> humble beginnings. Okay, so those are, by the way, our values are humble and ambitious. So, um, so humble beginnings. And just super stoked to have Mark with us as well, who I've engaged with now a few times, and he's just such a generous, absolute legend of a of a man, and just somebody that I really admire. And having seen some of his work online, you know, we are just very, very privileged tonight. So, okay, guys, so let's get cracking. Let's get stuck into the the questions. What we've done is we've fielded some questions from the community prior to this, um, and uh, and I, I want to obviously just tee it up and then we'll 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 uh, we'll allow you guys to to have a bit of a a shot at it by the way the prize tonight is uh, is somewhere around here it also includes a book verity's book uh it's brand new signed uh by verity and uh and uh and it's pretty freaking awesome so all right so i want to ask both of you um the the question of world champion right so how has this title actually changed your career i mean i'm picturing you walking the streets with those giant ribbons around and swanning around you know like you're owning the place but but seriously how is it i mean verity let's start with you how has it impacted your career in general it's what I thought would happen when I won versus what happened was very different because I thought it would be this instant change of life and it was instant in terms of interviews and podcasts and I wasn't ready for that onslaught. But the professional shift probably took about six months and now I'm just seeing this incredible knock-on that's come from it, getting to speak all over South Africa and now around the world. So it's, it's just opened up avenues for me, and that's what the contest does for speakers, you know, whoever gets lucky enough to get into the finals, not even just the winner. It opens up the most incredible opportunities. But the one I wasn't expecting and the one that I'm loving the most is coaching other speakers. And you'll hear from Mark because that's what he does and has been doing for years. But actually getting to help other speakers take their speaking to the next level. See, I've had three people now win their district level. They're into the world quarterfinals. So that, for me, is really fulfilling. And it's so nice that I'm not competing. <laughs> that's the best part. You never have to compete again. <laughs> so, so, Mark, if we can get Mark onto the, the screen. Um, Mark, how... How has it impacted you? I mean, you've been a world champion for some years now, and uh, oh. and and we'd love to hear from you. You know, how, in the beginning, how did it impact you, and how has it progressed over over the years? Well, first of all, thanks to everyone for having me come on your program today. It is a pleasure and a joy, and thank you for the question, and thank you to my new little sister Verity for answering half of it for me, <laughs> because the truth is, it does change your life. Mind you, I won the contest 27 years ago, and I do have the VHS videotape to prove it, by the <laughs> way. <laughs> but, 
But since winning, I have had the privilege of speaking on five continents to over 1.5 million people as a result of having won that contest. What does that really mean? It means that I changed my career from mainframe computer programming, which may sound like Greek to you because it was so long ago, and I began to speak professionally. In addition, over the last several years, I've also had a chance to coach several contestants, and I haven't done all the mathematics yet, but I've had several semifinalists, even regional finalists. I've served several, several contestants who have placed and I've also had the privilege of playing a small part in the success of four or five fellow world champions. The coolest thing for me is that here I am, 27 years in, and people still want to hear from me. <laughs> what is that all about? It really is interesting, but I consider it a blessing and a privilege. And for those who are new to Toastmasters and those who may not know much about Toastmasters, for those who, have, who are convention junkies, who have gone to the, to, to the Toastmasters convention every year, I have had the blessing over the past, I don't know, 15 years, to serve as the voice of Toastmasters at the event. So I get to travel, but I get to also serve in different ways. And just this morning, before I came online for this, I attended a Rotary International meeting here in central Georgia, USA, where I live. And as you may know, two years ago, Toastmasters and Rotary formed an alliance and I was able to talk about Toastmasters there as well. So the biggest changes are three. One, professional speaking. Two, professional coaching. And three, the opportunities to interact and encourage people, not only adults, but also young people around the world. And that, to me, is a thrill ride. And I hope it doesn't end too soon. We can we can certainly hear that you've got the the voice for it. It's it's this deep, beautiful. Why, thank you. <laughs> I'm going to start copying you and your voice. Um, I think that's probably a question that we. How do you project your voice? But uh, but I, I want to then just I want to go straight into some of the the weeds and one of the the um, the questions that keeps on coming up, Verity, and this is for you, is is that. I mean, for many of us in the in the audience, we're entrepreneurs and public speaking, pitching, presenting, projecting your ideas, being able to sell in public and that sort of thing is something that's pretty scary. And I, I wanted to ask you the question, why is it so scary? Why is it so scary for us to basically talk? I, it is crazy because, I mean, I've got a little boy, he's going to be three in August, and they are not afraid of making their voice heard. Like, you just spend any time with a child. Have you ever found a small child that is afraid of speaking? No, they're so happy to project their ideas. So there's a few things that kill it. I'm convinced that school orals is the start for all of us. Like, it just makes us terrified. And f for that, the one reason is you're talking about something you're not inspired by. And so you should never speak about something that doesn't mean something to you. And I think that's what kills the love of speaking and the ability to present naturally. But the, the thing that makes the most sense to me is actually based in nature as to why we're so afraid of, of public speaking. And it, if we had to go out into the bush right now, we would see that there are predators and there are prey. And the, the fundamental difference between predator and prey is that predators' eyes face forward because they're looking for lunch. Prey's eyes on the side of their head because they're trying to make sure they aren't lunch. If you stand up to speak here right now, which way are the audience's eyes facing? And this is the interactive part. <laughs> Forward. <laughs> so you know what our brains are thinking? We're lunch. It's very real. It is your brain is going, I am being hunted. But I think now it's like my idea is being hunted. My self-image is being hunted. I'm being judged. I'm going to get cut down. What if I'm not accepted? And then we, we put a lid on our voice, and we lose that ability to present our truth, our authentic passion. And so when you meet someone who speaks from that place, you love it, and you're influenced by it. You don't have to be a brilliant public speaker, but if you're speaking from the heart and you are backing what you're saying, people listen. And that is a skill you can learn. Yeah, it's such it's such a good point, um, uh, Mark. I want I want to go back to you quickly and uh, and just ask. I mean, you, you, when whenever I've spoken with you, you appear so confident and 
like you've got this, right? Like you don't seem scared at all. I, I want to ask you, was there any time, I mean, what has been the scariest moment for you in your public speaking career? If we can get you back. Good on. question. Here we go. I'll try to be concise, but I must piggyback on something that Bertie said earlier. And I believe this for everyone who has ever said, nope, I will not go on a platform. I don't believe there's so much in a fear of public speaking, but I believe we have a fear of public embarrassment. We fear public judgment. We wonder, are my clothes okay? Is there something in my nose? Is my hair right? And we think the audience is there to judge us. I will declare this for the most part, for the most part, your audience does not want you to fail unless you're in a speech contest against them. <laughs> but for the most part, your audience does not want you to fail. They, they're willing for you to succeed. So I encourage you, think less of being judged. And my mindset had to shift. And my mindset shift is now this. Every time I present, I consider it a blessed opportunity to share with an eager audience what I have worked so hard to, to give to them as a gift for them. And that mindset releases my tension. But scared, I'll only be scared and nervous under one circumstance if I know in my heart I'm not fully prepared. That's when I get nervous. So preparation is key for me. As far as scariest situations for speaking, scare, scary depends on, for me, circumstance. If I go into a, what I call a hostile environment, not hunter or hunted, but the audience doesn't want to be there. Someone made them come, and you can tell by their body language, their posture. And that, for me, was scariest when working with youth audiences ages 13 through 15. <laughs> and I've had a couple of those where I've, I, I had one. I had to abandon the presentation. I was in a school in North America, and the kids, it was a Friday afternoon before a long weekend, the headmaster wasn't there, and these kids at 13 and 14 can get pretty rambunctious. And it was clear to me they didn't want me to be there. I literally said, guys, girls, tell me yes or no. Should I stay or should I leave? You tell me the truth. Stay or leave. And they went, leave. I said, okay, <laughs> I'll leave you with one thought. Your behavior, your attitudes will cause people to judge you, and how you are judged will depend on, will de de reflect how you are treated going forward. I hope I've left you something of value today and I wish you well. And I turned around, packed up and walked out the door. Sure. Only <laughs> once in 27 years. But, <laughs> okay, so I, I, wanna, I wanna take a bit of a chance here because I, I love that, the fear of embarrassment. And um, yeah. so, so I'm gonna do a quick challenge to everybody in the audience here, by the way, like, I overcome this by embarrassing myself all the time. So I kind of <laughs> circumvent that part immediately, straight off the bat. I want to ask this audience here, and I also want to challenge everybody online, if you can introduce yourself. So I'm going to take 30 seconds, right? I'm going to ask everyone in the audience here tonight, in the physical audience, just to turn around to the person either next to you or behind you, somebody that you don't know, and just introduce yourself. Just say, hi, my name is... And then this is what I do. Is that okay? And online, we're going to ask you guys just to put in the comments, uh, hey, guys, this is my name, and this is, this is what I do. Okay, so, and go. you got 30 seconds. <laughs> Hello. My name is Greg. And I want a sip of wine. Okay, you got 10 more seconds. <laughs> we're gonna have to we're gonna have to play the music. Okay, everybody. <laughs> Seems like we've got a lot of public speakers in the house. Well done, guys. And look, that was the start, right? So afterwards, we're gonna have time to network and get to know each other a little bit better. So you can take those conversations a little bit further. By the way. 
one of the things that we've really realized, as much as Heavy Chef is a learning uh, platform with content at its center, it doesn't work without community, right? And the way we've structured it is peer-to-peer -peer learning. So the people that we host on our platform, people that we have uh, doing the interviews and, and providing the recipes are entrepreneurs themselves. So I encourage you guys to stick around afterwards, go up to somebody you don't know, introduce yourself, hand out business cards if you still have any, or just <laughs> tell each other what your LinkedIn profile is, and then take it from there. The people online, encourage you guys just to engage with each other, and... Um, and, and again, just if there's somebody interesting, reach out and, uh, and say hey and, uh, and connect. I mean, this is how we work. This is how we build a community, right? So thanks, guys. Thanks, Mark and Verity. These are really, really good questions. And I see we've got a couple of questions coming in from online. So I want to just quickly ask a question, which I'm fascinated by, also kind of leading from the same thread, is, I mean, you also seem very confident on stage. I've seen you a bunch of times, Verity. But, I mean... How do you deal with things when they invariably go wrong? And, and maybe you have some example or an example that you can speak to. So I wasn't always confident. I was the girl who would bunk school if I had to read the Bible in assembly. I was that scared. And I, I was always had a sore throat if it was my turn. And I just skipped it and skipped it. And eventually they caught me the one day. They just read, they got on to me. They were like, no, yeah, you're reading. And I mean, you get these involuntary things happening. You know, your throat closes up, the mouth gets dry, your stomach starts doing flick flacks. You discover that your right leg does a mean Elvis impersonation. And it's like letting you down at every turn. And I got on that stage and the only thing I could think to do was say, and God said, let there be light. And there was light. <laughs> and I just ran off the stage. And that was me. Like I would never, I would have happy to never speak in public again. And then I started songwriting, and that was like, well, that's going to be tricky being a singer who's afraid of being on stage. So I got a coach in America named Joe, and Joe looked like James Brown. He was a complete character. And when I went for my first lesson, he was like, Verity, come in. You're from South Africa. I'm so excited to meet you. And I was like, I played him a song, and I sang for him, and I finished. And he went, I'm not going to teach you how to sing. I'm going to teach you how to be confident. I was like, how do you teach someone to be confident? And the way Joe taught confidence was strange. He would turn up the music, turn down the music, switch off the music, knock over my microphone, shout in my face, and I would be like getting flustered. And he was like, you just keep on. Things are going to go wrong. You just keep on. And we did that for three solid months, five days a week. And I never thought that it actually worked until I came back to South Africa and I was backstage, uh, Robin Banks, if you know Robin Banks, the speaker, I was at an event in Johannesburg and he was letting me speak because I was crowdfunding an album and I needed people to buy my album. And he gave me this amazing opportunity in front of 600 people and he gave me a rock star welcome. So I was actually feeling quite confident at that stage, like I've got this and I had my little like Madonna headset on and I was like, he's uh -oh. like, ladies and gentlemen, there's this singer from Cape Town, welcome. And I'm like, woohoo. And they're like clapping and I run up the stairs and I get to the last step and I trip and I sprawl face first in front of 600 people. There was just this <gasps> from the room. There was no oxygen left and I was lying face first on the floor looking at stuff I didn't want to be that close to. And all of Joe's training kicked in and I looked around at these horrified faces and I went, I can only go up from here. <laughs> and they laughed, I laughed, I got up, I dusted myself off, more than half that room bought my album that didn't even exist at that point, I was crowdfunding. And I realized that's what Joe had been teaching me, is that if you are okay with things not being okay, and they're always not going to be okay, something will always go wrong when you're speaking, presenting, pitching, like the tech's going to fail, you're going to be late, someone's going to cough, things are going to go wrong. But when you're okay with things not being okay, that is confidence. And then nothing can get in your way because you can make a joke, you can adapt, you can deal with what's happened in the room. And as Mark says, the audience is relieved that you're okay, because they don't want to be up here speaking. And so that's been my shift, is I know that if I tip this over, we'll make a laugh, we'll carry on. It's not the end of the world. It doesn't mean I'm not enough. It just means things went wrong. So that's for me is what confidence is. And you've got to help someone practice getting it wrong. As Fred said, you just keep getting up and embarrassing yourself, and it's working. It's working. Uh, let's not push it. Um, <laughs> Not that bad. <laughs> no, but but yeah. I think that's a great point. And it, it kind of 
leads on from what Mark was saying about being prepared. That's part of the preparation, right? To have in mind, you know, the structure of your talk, have being prepared for the message you want to convey and uh, and the emotions you want to elicit, but also be prepared for when things invariably do go wrong. I mean, I've run, uh, you know, more events than I can think of, and the amount of times that uh, the tech did not go wrong is pretty much zero. <laughs> like, that's just the honest truth, always. <laughs> Let me just say something always goes wrong. So, I, look, I, just a point that I want to jump on, Mark, and this is for you. Um, in terms of eliciting emotions, I mean, can you talk to that? Can you talk about what are the type, types of emotions that you want to, to elicit in your audience and, and, and to get their buy-in and, and, and commitment to your presentation? Um, because emotion is obviously what you, you, you – I mean, you want to try and get that from people, right, rather than it just being – a dry delivery. Yes, I, I, I do appreciate the question. I, this may sound very academic, but I learned that back in the 19, I guess it was 70s, a psychologist in the USA, Dr. Paul Ekman, determined there were six basic common emotions, happiness, sadness, anger, fear, surprise, and disgust. Of course, there's also Plutrick's wheels of, wheel of emotion that has a breakdown of extensions of those six basic emotions. But I have the benefit of learning from Michael Haig. Michael Haig is a Hollywood script consultant to the stars. They'll send their scripts to him and he'll approve them. And Michael says, the purpose of a story is to elicit emotion. But for me, the transference of emotion from me, the speaker, to the audience comes from one basic truth. This is, this is the foundation of everything I teach and everything I do. And I tell people, don't give speeches. Those who are experienced, I say, stop giving speeches. Start delivering experiences. Stop giving speeches. Start delivering experiences. And one simple way to do that is with stories. And to go deeper, when I tell stories... I, don't, I say, don't really retell them, relive them. Introduce us to the characters. Take us into their situation. Let's hear their voices. Let's experience their emotion in conversation. Let's feel the conflict they feel. Let's feel the pain that we feel. And when telling your own story, go back to that time and that place. Relive the emotion and allow that to flow from you in its most natural form. If I try too hard to make the audience cry, they'll see right through me. But if I share from my heart what I experienced and connect with the audience, the emotion generally flows more easily. My last thought on this particular question is this. At times, we aren't able to elicit emotion because we are too mechanical, too pedantic. We focus so much on the facts and figures, the stats and the numbers, and if we simply turn some of those numbers into people, emotional connection is made and your audience buys in to your message and to your story. That may sound like a mouthful, but to crystallize that down, characters and stories are connectors. When we become the characters and relive the experiences, then the audience is not just hearing it. They're actually in the story themselves. And it can make a very big difference for the emotional connection. It has to be over, it has to be overshadowed by one more thing. Well, actually two. It's authenticity and vulnerability. Vulnerability. And very quickly, a year ago, almost a year ago, Verdi Price was very vulnerable when she told her sad story to the world. But the world received it and named her a world champion. So I think it works. Cheapers, that's a great answer. I love that, um, delivering experiences. And I think that rings so true. Um, I have, I have a, a, a bunch of questions from the online audience, so keep, keep them coming, guys. Um, one, which is it's, it's quite a personal question, which I, I really I think it's quite cool, but Stephen Davey has asked, um, and, and I, I guess, I suppose this is for both of you, but, but the question is, I find that the first few minutes of any engagement sets the vibe, make or break, yet this is when I'm most nervous. Um, 
what do you do to settle your energy for starting out the talk? Mark always says ladies first, so I will answer. He's <laughs> such a gentleman. <laughs> So, I mean, there's, there's simple things like, and I mean, if you've seen Amy Cuddy's work on the power of body language, just having a power pose before you go on stage, and I mean, if you can't do it, if you're in a room, it's just sitting back, being aware that you're not closing down your body, telling your brain that you're in danger, just opening up your stance and taking deep breaths and breathing out more than you breathe in, because we hold our breath when we're nervous, and if I'm breathing out, I'm telling my brain I'm safe. So that's little things you can do before. And I mean, I know before my TEDx talks, I speak for a living. I was nervous and I was walking around backstage with my power pose and my breathing and that helps. But then also having a prepared introduction where you've decided how can I get a reaction from my audience, whatever I'm looking for, in those first 30 seconds. So I've got that nod and I've got those warm eyes on me because the eyes are what are scaring us. And if I've got people nodding and then I find my few friendly faces, I go, okay, these are my safe people. But it's preparing an introduction that gets you into the presentation, into the story instantly. Not like, thank you so much. I'm sorry that I've, my PowerPoint's not working because that's going to disconnect you. And then you can't find your feet again. You practice that. The rest can be from the heart. But a clear opening where you intentionally have decided how you're going to get the audience's connection with you, that helps to set you up for success. And that's the preparation. That doesn't happen naturally. I love the fact that, as you said, that there were a bunch of people just putting their shoulders back, <laughs> getting all <laughs> stretchy. And um, Mark, would you like to add to that? Sure. Briefly, yes. There are others. There are ways to get ready even before you say your first word. And there are a couple of ideas. I know some people meditate. Some say prayers, which I do. Others have a playlist in their earbuds that they'll play just to get them pumped up and ready. They think like, you know, I'm here to pump you up, I'll be ready. And they do that to get themselves ready. There's one more thing you can do in terms of your introducer's words, the master of ceremonies words. If you write, and I, I recommend you do this, write exactly what you want the master of ceremonies to say and write an introduction that is not your CV or your biography, but rather why you are there, why they need to hear what you have to say in such a way that the introduction given by the master of ceremonies sets you up to go right into your presentation. That way you don't need to set the bar yourself. It's also wise, as Verity says, to have opening remarks that are not about the weather or the traffic unless that is directly linked to the remarks you want to make. You want to start off with a bang. So whatever you need to do to prepare yourself, please do that. I'll offer one other quick tip for meal events like breakfast meetings or dinner meetings. I do not, I repeat, I do not eat right before I speak. The last thing I want to do is have to find my, excuse me, myself, my body concerned about doing this, right? You don't want that. So I don't drink any dairy to coat my throat, no cream, no milk. I'll have room temperature water and I'll eat an hour or more before the presentation. My brain is not concerned about digestion. My brain and my heart are concerned about serving my audience. I love that. It's so practical and, <laughs> and yet it's quite obvious, right? But we, we just don't, we, we don't get that into our brains that that's what we've got to do. And I think as entrepreneurs, I think we have to get around to the fact that just by nature, we are public speakers. We've got to pitch, we've got to present, we've got to sell, we've got to convince, coerce, and connect, interact with others all the time as part of what we do, right? So um, uh, there's a few more questions coming from online. I want to open it up to the audience here. And bearing in mind, remember, we're going to hand out a prize of this beautiful Sydney back as well as some books afterwards. Uh, so we do have one question in the back. Can, may I ask that you walk to the mic over there, do the walk of fame? <laughs> and uh, <laughs> this is your public speaking opportunity. Thank you very much, Fred. Um, I had a question either I can answer. Um, I just did a quick Google search on how long Toastmasters World Championships have been going on and uh, found that 
it was only in 1973 that women were allowed to enter. And that is still pretty shocking to me that there's only five or six winners. And I wanted to know why you think that is. And for Verity, has there been any compromises you needed to make, such as lowering your voice or changing your posture? Um, so yeah, that's just open up to you guys. Cheapers, that's it's a, a great good question. question. And Mark's wow. asked me many times in, in podcasts and interviews. So there's, I think there's many theories as to why it is. I know my sister Kay made it to the world semifinals in 2012. And so I kind Kay of- Kay is here, by Kay the way. Kay is here, so, so she's also a Southern now. African Ooh. champion of speaking. <laughs> <Woo -hoo! laughs> and I remember Kay coming back from an in-person conference, which has got 3,000 people in the room. It's a hell of a thing. I mean, I was in my bedroom on Zoom, you know, very different experience. But she came back saying she could see why women maybe weren't placing because a lot of women, if you are a mother, you don't have time if you don't win the first time around to keep coming back. So I think there is something in that is not a lot of women have got that capacity. And last year, I felt like I was doing an Ironman or the Olympics. That's how much space I took up in my life. I was working three to four hours a day on a seven minute speech. I mean, it seemed mad, but it, it was worth it in the end, but I didn't know it was gonna pay off. So there's that side. And then I do think whether we like it or not, physicality does play into bias on stage. I think the virtual world has opened it up. So many more women are placing at country level and getting through now. Um, whereas on a stage, it could be stature, it could be pitch. It, there are things that, and you'll see a lot of the women might end up in a power suit. Although in the 80s, I believe some of them were in beautiful floral dresses and they managed to win. So I think it depends, but you, whether we like it or not, there can be a bias in judging at times. But what I'm loving is I'm seeing a lot of women placing in Middle Eastern countries and going through as their champions. So something is changing and the voices and the messages seem to be equalizing, which is very exciting. Mark, can you add your thoughts? Yes, a quick thought. 2018 Toastmasters International World Championship of Public Speaking. That was the first year, first, second, and third were all women. Two from North America, first and third, and one from China, Sherry Su. She was second in the world, all a five foot nothing, cute as a button, and one of my coaching clients. And I was so proud of her to see her come second. But if three women, three women can outspeak 35,000 entrants from around the world, then there certainly is hope. I know I, I overheard when I saw Barry to give a talk recently, and she told a simple story about someone who wanted, well, I'll let Verdi tell the story of the lottery. Of the, of the lottery. Go ahead, Verdi, tell the story, the lottery story. Come on. <laughs> if I tell, tell the it. lottery story. So it's a story yes. about the lottery. <laughs> so it's a, it's a story of a man who wanted to win the lottery more than anything. So he would watch every Saturday, and he wouldn't win, and he'd be back next Saturday watching the numbers, and he wouldn't win. And this went on for months. And eventually one Saturday when again he hadn't won, in frustration he looks up at the sky and goes, why? Why do you never let me win? And a voice came down and said, you might want to buy a ticket. <laughs> so it's how many women enter is maybe what Mark is saying. But you have to put your name in the hat. That's the only way to win anything. You've got to be in it to win it. <laughs> That's it. Um, Okay, guys, so we're going to have more questions from the audience. There's a few more questions from the online. I, I'm going I'm, I'm to use my, my power and authority on the stage and with the mic to ask a question that I've been dying to ask because I think it's a magical story. And um, it's a story that I don't think you've really shared much about, which I know because I was, kinda, I was there when you won and so on. But I think it's a really amazing part of this is that you... Um, it was the lead up and, and something that you did around intention. And it kind of relates to what we just spoke about now. Uh, that if, if you don't mind, would you be prepared to share with the audience? Sure. So what Fred said in the introduction is that with this contest, you have one speech that you do for seven months that gets you to the world finals. And if you get in the finals two days later, you need to do a speech you've never competed with. And so part of that winning mindset is when do you start preparing that speech? So the minute I won Southern Africa, there was six weeks before we'd hear if I'd made the semifinals. And I thought, well, I can't wait. So I started looking for that speech. And 
it found me at three o'clock one morning, which is not a great time for a speech to find you. <laughs> but it woke me up and I wrote the speech and it was about my dad and inspiring me to rewrite the story of my life. And in the first version, it was a memory of how I did a challenge called the 100 Happy Days Challenge on Facebook. This is probably 10 years ago. And it really got me out of depression and anxiety. And that was the first version of the speech. And I, and I wrote it at three in the morning and I looked at it and something in me went, this, this could win the world finals, this story. And then I was like, I wonder how, how many days the world finals is from today. And I went on to the 28th of August and it was exactly 100 days away. And so I started the 100 Happy Days Challenge on Instagram that night. I said, even if I don't win, I've got 100 days between now and the finals. I would like to get there happy, <laughs> whatever happens. And for 100 days, I documented things that were making me happy. And yeah, we were here on this stage on day 100 when I heard I'd won. But it was, yeah, it was pretty magical. That, and the speech, if you, if, if you watch the final speech, I do not speak about the 100 Happy Days Challenge. I wrote 32 versions of the speech, so you changed a lot. But it was, for me, the intention of going, I don't have control over the outcome. You know, you can't guarantee you're going to win anything. But I could guarantee that I was going to arrive there the best version of myself. My sister and my husband will attest to the fact I was also a very stressed version of myself, but the 100 happy days, it helped. And it was pretty magical that it just, the timing was prophetic. I mean, if, there, if there's ever a story about giving people hope for setting in intention, and there's so, I think there's so much to that, which is, which is inspiring. Um, but, I mean, once you won, Mark, I mean, you were, um, you, you played a role in supporting Verity after the win itself. And, and potentially, can you talk to some of the other speakers that you've given encouragement to and, and just what encouragement you do provide for them? Because, I mean, you know, you, you, you do this for a living and you speak so well yourself, but, but we want to know the kind of support and advice that you provide for the, the kind of baby speakers amongst us. Well, thanks for asking that question, Fred. You know, most speakers come, they want technical advice, how to which is certainly part of what I offer. But you said the encouragement. And sometimes encouragement comes in terms of what direction should you take? I'm often asked, how do I say this? Well, this character, am I too loud? Am I too soft? Do I move here? Do I move there? Well, I'm online now, I can't use the whole stage. And I get all these questions. I always go back, I say, go back to your message. And what will you do that will best serve your message and touch your audience. At other times, I may have people come to me and they're in a quandary as to what to do. I want to go this way, I want to go that way, I want to see that person, I want to, and I'm, I'm going to pick on my, my new little sister here, Verity, and she was really eager to get the best she could, the best advice she could, the best experience she could by polling other champions. This is very common, by the way. I'll have someone come to me and my friend Aaron LaCroix, who I coached back in 01, and other world champions. In Verity's case, I could see her heart. She just wanted to be the best that she could be, and she wasn't sure who would be the best person to help her. And here is key. Not everyone with a credential is going to be the best mentor, support, and coach for you. I'll say it again. Not everyone with the best credential it will be the best supporter and coach for you. As an entrepreneur, you're going to need advisors. You're going to need mentors. And they may have technical knowledge. But there has to be a relationship that you have with them whereby you trust them, they trust you, and you build that kind of bond and you can work with them through their experience. I've been blessed enough that I'm a fairly nice guy. Not too many people want to hurt me. And I try to be the best help I can. Funny enough, in the case of Verity, I pretty much pushed her away and I sent her to someone else because I thought it was better for her to work with them. I don't need any more notches on my belt. I don't need any more, oh, Mark, you helped 10 world champions. That isn't the point. How can we help someone to be the best they can be in the best environment that they can be in? And sometimes I'm not the best for them. I need to acknowledge that and then pass it on to somebody else. So I hope... As an entrepreneur, as you're watching this, if you're live or if you're coming by live stream, there may be those who do have great expertise. But please remember, a relationship that you can establish to be better 
will in the long run reap, reap rich dividends. And now, as a new world champion, Verity and I have a different relationship, but it's so much better. Having not been the one to coach her last year, I thought it was the right thing for her to go to someone else. I hope I've answered your question. But Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. It also speaks a lot, I think, um, to something that we, we talk a lot about at, at Heavy Chef is, is, is surround yourself with the right people. Surround yourself with good people. You know, I think it's, it's one of the most important things as entrepreneurs that we can do is right from the outset not make it a... a like a lone wolf journey. You, you have to be with people that support you, that provide energy, that, that you can serve yourself uh, and, and help guide you along the way. You look like you wanted to add something? You? No, no, no. I just, I, I, was, I was so grateful to Mark because then maybe this is the speaking to mentorship. I, I would approach three different world champions and then I was like, who do I choose? Because they're all amazing and they're all fantastic. And he was sending me voice notes on, on Facebook saying, listen to your heart. And I actually knew Lance Miller, who was my coach. We'd met. So we had that relationship Mark speaks about. But he coached me to go get another coach, which was amazing. And I was so grateful because he just helped me make up my mind. Because sometimes we, we get caught between I could do this, I could do this, I could do this. And it was just when I needed it. It was like, make a decision, trust yourself. And it was the right decision for me. Um. So, do we have any questions from the audience here? We have one question. Uh, would you like to step up to the mic? Yes, that's you. Here we go. Hello, Verity. Hello, Mark. Uh, so, I've done quite a lot of public speaking, and when I originally started, and I used to be so anxious, somebody gave me the advice, get up on the stage and just consider everyone in the audience not wearing any clothes. And that really kind of broke the ice for me. But my question to you is, in this world in which we now live, hybrid, uh, to me, public speaking was always about getting up on stage and speaking to real people in real life. And Verity, you were saying that when you took part in the championship, you were in your bedroom. And so my question is really, um, where does that take public speaking? Are we looking at a future where public speaking will be a hybrid of sometimes you'll be in your bedroom and other times you'll be up on stage. Um, it's just, you know, of interest and, of course, moving into the metaverse where things might be even further removed. I'm just interested in your and Mark's take on that. Mark, do you want to take the first guess, dibs at this? Yes. <laughs> I guess I will take the lead this time. Okay. Hybrid is here to stay. I just got some information. I can't share my screen, but I'll, I'll read it for you. Uh, a co company called uh, Cision reported back in July of 2020. Headline says this, virtual events industry expected to grow from $78 billion to $774 billion by the year 2030. That's a billion with a B. There'll be a tenfold growth in virtual events industry in the next seven years, eight years. Hybrid is here to stay. Virtual is here to stay. Organizations are seeing that they can save money, not flying people everywhere. There's food and beverage. There's events set up. Just ask Fred Road about all of that. Yep. And they're now Speak finding to ways to I'll be at the re bar. <laughs> redirect their funding. And they're having speakers come in virtually. I did virtual keynotes last year for a large franchise here in North America. And they saved my travel, my hotel, my accommodations, my meals. But they still pay me my full fee. So across the globe now, the idea of virtual has now been established. It's not going away. If we are serious... We will need to know how to handle the medium very, very well. How to close deals virtually very, very well. We've, the idea of video conferencing is not new. We've had Google Hangouts and Google Meets for a long time. We've had audio conferences in one conference room and somebody beams in for a long time. We will now have more of the same. And quickly, technology is, is keeping pace. We are now, companies are now building platforms to have meetings with over 10 and 20 and 50,000 people at one time. So the world is shifting. At the same time, 
There will not be an abandonment of live events because live events are vibrant events. People want to see each other. They want to shake hands. They want to interact. So hybrid is going to be very, very common. And I've done hybrid events this year. Most of my events this year were hybrid. Even the ones I was flown to as recently as 19 May, there was a hybrid component, a camera in the back of the room, and someone somewhere was beaming in by a live stream just as I am doing right now. Isn't going to go away. Let's master the virtual world, learn all that we can, and become comfortable with it. It's now, not the future. It is now. Thirsty? I think, yeah, so I agree with everything Mark said. But what I want to add to this about the power of virtual, and that's what I discovered last year, is I never had an audience for seven months. So I never knew if it was connecting. I had to write my presentation imagining it was connecting. I did test it on Zoom audiences and got feedback, but I had to write it for an audience I was never going to get feedback from. And then I heard the 2020 world champion Mike Carr say something in an interview that really struck me, is that when you are speaking virtually, you are speaking to one person. Everyone feels like you're speaking just to them. Right now, I can't see the people at the back of the room, and they can't see me as well. We all see Mark. He's the same size for all of us, so we all get the same experience of his message. But in a room, depending on where you're sitting, it, it does create distance between you and the speaker, and I'd never thought about that. And so when we learn to look beyond the camera to someone that we care about, and that, that audience, I've got a message for you, I've got something I believe in, and you speak from that place, you can connect to thousands of people, whereas in the room you can only connect to the hundred that are there. And that really excited me, realizing when you get comfortable with the camera and you, you learn to speak through it, not at it, but through mm. it to each person, it allows a different type of connection, not the same as live, but in this hybrid world, I think it gives us an opportunity to connect meaningfully as well. I love um, that line. Look through the camera. One of my Mark-isms is this. Focus on your friends behind the lens. Focus on your friends behind the lens. What that means is, for some people, they get a photograph of their cat, their dog, or their loved one, and they punch a hole in the nose, and they cover the camera lens with the picture, and just the lens alone is the hole. They look at the person's photograph and look through that at the lens. Others are more low-tech. They'll put a sticker next to their camera, and it says, point, look here every time you speak. And that reminds them where to look. Whatever works for you, speak through the camera as if to someone you love, and they'll get the message if it comes from your heart through that lens to their own. Again, virtual and hybrid are here to stay. Let's make the most of it. Yeah, that's great. There's uh, Louise De Silva from uh, the online audience. Hola, Louise. She asked, how do you adjust your speech when it is online versus on stage? Is there any difference? And I think you kind of touched upon that now. I don't know if there's anything else you well, want. Well, the difference is in... Well, you can have interaction online as well. So it depends. Are you using the chat or are you interacting with an audience? So for a live audience, you've got to adjust for laughter. You've got to let them laugh. You can't be rushing through your presentation and you've got to adjust with what's happening in the room and use your space. You know, you're a little bit restricted when you're in your box. Now you've got a stage. I mean, we've sat here all day, but we could be moving. And so there is a difference in, in audience interaction. That's the, that's the difference. A little hack that There's something do. else, though. Uh, Fred, forgive me, but Verity, please address this. Because when you're competing in Toastmasters, the difference is, as I understand it, you aren't allowed to see your audience in gallery view. So in essence, you're speaking just to that camera lens and imagining 80,000 people watching you. How does that change the experience for you? It, it was surreal, Mark. I mean, I was actually, it was like practicing an Oscar acceptance speech in your mirror because I was just speaking to myself and thinking I must be rocking this and hoping for the best. It was very <laughs> weird. Um, so it wasn't the same, but I think that's where it becomes like, it's almost like an acting gig that kind of contest where you're not working the chat and seeing the people. It was a very different experience. It's not, I love this kind of speaking and I love online when I've got an audience I can interact with and I can see. We got, quite, we got a funny question coming in from Tariro in uh, Tariro Matabiri in the, in the online audience, um, who's clearly feeling quite bullish about this. He, he wants to know, 
when is the right time to start charging for um, guest speaker appearances? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, do you have to wait? Did you have to wait until you became a world champion? I guess this is a question for both of you to start charging unashamedly. Uh, unashamedly. Unashamedly <laughs> being the, the operative word here. The adverb. Oh, Millions. Wow. <laughs> Just, just to, just to underpin the fact that both Mark and Verity are generously giving their time here tonight. For so free. We're not, <laughs> we are not. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so just a massive thank you to both of you. Not to get any ideas from Tarira's question. <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing is, you know, I, I learned early on. I was very naive, very young at this. I was, a, I was a mainframe computer programmer when I won the world championship. Verity is a seasoned pro. I didn't know, I mean, I didn't know what I was doing. But I learned to speak for fee, for free, until I spoke for fee. I learned to speak for free until I spoke for fee. And the fee came when I felt I was competent enough, I provided value enough for the audience that it was worth them investing their time and their money to hear from me. Winning a world title doesn't mean you're going to be going to get paid, you know, $10,000 the first time you give a speech. No, it means you have an opportunity to hone your craft even more and develop something you can, you can build a career from if you so choose. There are many world champions who speak as a second income and they maintain their day job, if you will. But to me, a fee is based not upon my credential, but upon the value I provide to the audience. Am I serving the audience? Am I changing their people? Am I advising them well? Am I giving them tools they can use to increase their bottom line? Customers and clients will pay for value before they'll pay for a credential. Ready? No, I, I agree. I mean, my experience of speaking was also, I've, I spoke for free until people started offering to pay me. And it's, it's an organic journey. It's not like any other gig where you start and people pay you. you. You learn on stage in front of audiences and when it starts adding value, when people have something they can take home, they can apply into their life or their business, that's when you can start attaching a value to it. But one of the funniest things I ever heard was uh, Douglas Kruger, who's a two or three time Southern African champion who came second in the world a few years ago. Someone once asked him, do you have to be funny to be a professional speaker? And he said, only if you want to get paid. So, <laughs> so maybe wow. that's like bring in the humor and maybe you'll see the fee goes up. I don't know. <laughs> that's an interesting angle on it. I, I want to then talk about, I mean, for, for both of you, just some practical bits then. Um, the one which I think would be useful for all of us is uh, what is a practical framework, um, Verity? And let's, let's let, let you talk to this, that you can you can go over or, or, or share with us that our audience can use in preparing for a public speaking gig? So there's a few ways to approach it. There's the obvious, have you got a great introduction, an easy to follow body, and a conclusion that kind of has your call to action and ties your whole speech together. So that's the, the 101 of writing a great speech. But what I realized after winning last year was that a speech or a presentation, it's a gift that you give to your audience. And Mark's been saying that a lot. You are giving it to the audience to take home. And if you've given them something valuable, they're going to make it meaningful for them. So I came up with a way of remembering how to do that by taking that word gift and unpacking it. So your first step for any presentation is get clear on your message. What is it that you want them to know, do, or feel when you finish speaking? So whether it's a pitch or a presentation or speaking at a special event, what's that one thing in a sentence or less that they will be able to say back like the chorus of a song? You know, I remember that was the message of that. So get clear on your message, and that's not an easy step. People, have, and I think it's Diane Boyer says, if you can't say your message in a sentence, you're not going to be able to say it in an hour. So if someone asks you what's the message of this and you're still explaining yourself three minutes later, you don't know what your message is. So get clear on your message. And then speaking to Mark's point, intentionally craft the stories and the personal experience that you're going to put around that message so that it lands in people's hearts. Because if we're trying to come from the facts and the figures, you're speaking to their prefrontal cortex and you're not getting any connection, you're not getting any commitment. So what are the stories I can tell? What are the analogies I could use so that people can see what I saw and hear what I heard and feel what I felt? Then they're going to learn what you learned. Then they're going to take the message home. So that's the eye of the gift. The F is to fill in the gaps for your audience. 
who is the audience you're speaking to and what are the kind of questions or needs that they might have from you that you need to consider to put into your presentation so that you don't get hundreds of questions at the end. You don't want to leave them getting lost on a point. What did you mean there? And now they're Googling it. You want to keep them with you. So fill in the gaps for them. And the final step that I think makes great presentations is, and that's coming to the conclusion, is that it ties, everything ties together. Your last few minutes should just be tying back everything you've said already and reinforcing your message so that that call to action is so clear and so obvious. So for me, think about your presenting as a gift for the audience. What am I giving them? What is the message I want them to know? What stories am I going to tell that bring that message to life? Have I considered the gaps my audience might have that they need me to fill in? And am I tying it together? The last thing you ever want to do is trail off and miss that opportunity to connect in your conclusion. Yeah, that's a, I mean, that's amazing. That's such a, it's a gift to us, I think, just to be able to remember that as a beautiful mnemonic to, uh, to remember. Mark, can you talk to maybe some tactics that you've deployed or that you use that you could potentially share with us? In terms of delivery or pre De preparing delivery. for a presentation? Yeah, or delivery. How, how narrow do you want to go with that? Well, it's something that comes to mind, something that, that potentially we've not heard of. Ah. Or... <laughs> Thank you. All of us prepare our presentations, and the truth be told, don't tell anyone I told you this, but <laughs> most professional thing. presenters have prepared presentations. Toastmaster says every new project, give a new speech, which is great to build your chops, so to speak. But most professionals have two, three, or four presentations that they give over and over again. And very often they're hired just to give that presentation. It's prepared. They know it cold. But one technique I find very helpful is we have our, our stories in our, in our presentations. But if we replace one of our stories with a story about the client, their organization, their leadership, or their people on the ground, what that tells your client is you did not just come to deliver your speech from your back pocket, but you took the time to find out about them, where they are, their struggles, their joys, their sorrows, their wins, their losses. But you truly took time to understand them where they are, and you replaced one of your my stories to one of their stories. That's now personalizing and customizing it just for them. One of my habits, friends, is when I'm asked to do a conference, I ask, what's your conference theme? And what would be a win for you? What do you want your audience to walk away with? By asking those two questions, the organizer knows I'm concerned about them and their objective. I'm not just coming to bring a Mark Brown wow speech and walk away with a paycheck. It makes a significant difference when you and I as presenters customize our presentations for audiences. And when you and I as entrepreneurs show our clients and our prospects that we understand them, their business, and why we are best able to serve them and their business and thus secure their business. Think of customization as a means of building the relationship. And hopefully if you do that well enough, it can serve you in your business, but more importantly, serve your client, prospect, and audience as well. That's, that's great. Very, very, very cool. Thank you, Mark. Uh, also, I just love the thread of service that you bring through everything that you do. And I think that's such a, it's, it's such a beautiful way of living, really, to think about it, even as entrepreneurs. Think about who you're serving. You are not the hero in the story. The people that you serve should be the heroes. And I think that's uh, it's something that we've learned at, at Heavy Chef as well. Guys, we've got a time for a few more questions. Uh, Philip, we have a question. For, uh, do, do you want to step up and introduce yourself, please? Hi. Uh, my name is Philip. Um, I'm a corporate consultant. I've been running a consulting firm for the past seven years. And I'm lucky enough to be a mentor at Alan Gray. And Mark, I'm also a software engineer in the training, so I'm graduating at the end of the year. <laughs> Frameworks. <laughs> and uh, my question is, when did you guys realize that you wanted to serve a bigger purpose? When did you realize that this is what I want to do? Did you s sit down with yourself and say, I see a need 
for what I want to provide in the world, or I want to solve a problem, do I, I want to inspire people to become more, I want to see the world change. When did you see that? When did you decide oh. that yeah. I want to be bigger than this? I want to play a major role in people's lives. And yeah. Okay, that's a big question for first. both of you. Big question. I want to jump in first. Yeah. Okay. Because I remember when I was leaving high school in 1923. Um, <laughs> 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 I left high school in the 70s. Uh, for those who are wondering, I'll be 61 years old in a couple of months. What? And the only evidence is my gray eyebrows. I, did, I, did, I deliberately did not use the eyebrow pencil Like today. a fine wine. Yeah. Yeah. Well, listen, you're the ones drinking the wine. Nobody told me to bring wine today. But we in, try to entice in, you to come to South Africa, Mark. <laughs> but in Jamaica, when I was growing up in high school, before we left our last year, our classmates would write funny things about us in our annual yearbook. And what they wrote about me, I've since used in my presentations. My high school buddies wrote, always seen in the center of a crowd, relating one of his experiences to his listeners who have to make sure they have their dictionaries with them for frequent consultations. Back in the 1970s, my high school classmates saw me as a presenter when I didn't see it myself. I was a mainframe computer programmer who was minding his own business and I entered my Toastmasters contest on two hours notice to replace someone that was never my plan. However, having gone through my first contest all the way to the world championship, in 94 and losing, I said I must try this one more time, win, lose, or draw. And after winning in 1995, and I suspect there are individuals in the room live with you, Fred, who weren't born when I won that contest, I felt I needed to share the messages inside me. I believed I, was, I had received a gift, and, and for me to not use it would have been a betrayal to my creator and I, and I believe with all my heart, I am called to serve in this way. It may sound super spiritual, but it really is what I love to do. And I consider myself privileged to get to do what I do every single day, both as a presenter and as a coach for other presenters as well. That's my story. Oh, that's amazing. I mean... Uh... Jung spoke about, you know, don't think about work, think about your vocation. And the word vocation comes from vocare, which means your calling. And, uh, and I think we should all think about that. What is our calling, right? So, Verity. So, mine felt like a calling because at quarter past four in the afternoon on my 20th birthday, which was the exact time I was born, and I'm very big with numbers and it all has to be meaningful. If you spend time with me, you'll realize that. I remember dates. It's ridiculous. But out of nowhere, I felt called to write. And when I finished writing, it, it was a song because there was a verse and a chorus and a verse and a chorus, and I didn't know where it had come from. And in that day, it felt like someone switched on a tap because these songs kept coming and I kept writing and I had to get over the stage fright. But my ego was convinced I was meant to be a superstar and I was going to win Grammys and I was going to tour the world and it was all going to happen for me. And so I got caught in a struggle between maybe what my soul wanted and what my ego wanted. And so when my music career didn't work out and I'd crowdfunded an album and everyone was saying, please come speak about the crowdfunding, come tell us about the thinking. And then I'd say, can I bring my band? And they would say, no. <laughs> and I'd go, that was not my plan. And the speaking suddenly started happening for me. I realized that, that your ego has one idea for your life and your soul has another. And my soul's idea was my job is to teach people from some of the hard lessons I've learned. And, and Mark spoke mm. about my, my winning speech last year. It was about being miserable at 40 and how I turned that around. So I've realized that my calling is to share what I've learned with people and hopefully it helps them to maybe not have to go through some of those things and it gives them hope and inspiration. But when I, when I got out of the way of, of my ego's idea of what my life should look like, things really unfolded for me. And this is a tough industry but I found it much easier to be a professional speaker than I did trying to be a professional singer. So I think when you're doing what you meant to, the doors open. You still have to work hard, but yeah. So it's been there since I was 20, but it, it took 26 years for me to, to finally get something that looked a bit like a Grammy. <laughs> 
Well, you've done a fine 26 job. Twenty-six years, twenty-six uh, years to become an overnight success, Verdi. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Isn't that always the case? We we got to meet um, Ed Sheeran. Remember that? And he was saying in the the audience with us that. Um, it, it was, he was, I mean, people didn't know that. They thought he was a youngster. He just came out the gates hot. But it was eight years of just sleeping on couches and, you know, basking his, his heart out for every single night for eight years before he actually got his first hit, which was like the A-team or something. Yeah. I can't remember. Yeah. But um, we've got a fantastic question from, uh, from the online audience. So uh, forgive me if I do a hatchet job on this name, but it's Josephine Leomont Cricky. Um, and the question is, I've been told I'm very emotional. If I let my emotions flow, i.e. a sad yet empowering story, uh, how do I stop myself from crying for several minutes? <laughs> so That's, uh, wow. Mark? Good question. Good question. Uh, don't be ashamed of your emotions. But here's a thought, one of my friends, Ed Tate, who won the world title in 2000, 22 years ago, he said, do not use the platform for therapy. In other words, you may have a story you, need to you would like to share, but within yourself, your heart and your mind aren't quite ready to share it yet. Your message, as my friend Craig Valentine, who was a 1999 world champion, says, your message is a mess with age. Your message is a mess with age. And sometimes we need that age to kick in so we are in a place where we can reasonably share our message without losing control. And I say losing control for a reason. A little known fact is that in 2000 and and I think it was, David Henderson won the World Championship of Public Speaking. He's an attorney out of Texas, USA, and he joined Toastmasters to find out how to not cry when giving presentations. He even cried in the World Championships and won the trophy. The difference there was his tears were genuine, but they weren't overwhelming him or the audience. It didn't appear to be manipulative. So it was genuine emotion, but he knew, even though he would share the emotion, it would not detract from the message he was trying to give. It is okay, even encouraged, to show genuine, authentic emotion. We can't close ourselves off and become automatons who just spout facts and figures and numbers. Because if our, if our being is incongruent with the message we're sharing, then the audience is, will not likely want to buy it. If we're going to say we're enthusiastic and don't tell our face, our audience, our prospects won't buy it. If we express frustration and we don't show it, it's less likely our audience is going to buy it. So be honest, be authentic, be natural, but be sure you will not get lost in the, in the emotions. You go to a dark place and can't find your way back. That's my only word of caution there. Um, that's a, it's a great answer. And thank you, Josephine, for a great question. Uh, we've got a bunch of questions in the audience. Can we start with you, sir, if you wouldn't mind grabbing the microphone? One, two, mic check. Ah, hello, everyone. <laughs> Evening. <laughs> that's why I always start with checking the mic. I'm always nervous when it comes to talking. Um, I just have two simple questions uh, that are troubling me. Uh, when you are preparing, let's say, a speech, uh, and then you select a terminology, when you find or when you come to the audience, then the terminology that you are using is contradicting with the understanding of the audience. What do you do? Uh, secondly, in the process of preparing a speech, then let's say you have involved the story. You are thinking the story. It's well-trained. It's known by everyone. But when you find this particular audience, the audience doesn't know the story, 
And now the meaning of the speech is becoming more vague. So in, in that particular uh, uh, situation, what do you do to make sure that uh, the message of the speech is still contained and also it's received by the audience? Thank you very much. Gosh, great questions. Two very good questions. Very Thank you, good sir. questions. Just, so, just by the yeah. way, the rule is normally one, one question. But he per, got them in there. But those he got are them in good there. Questions, so we'll <laughs> let this one slide. So, so on the, the first one around terminology, and I don't know, I mean, my sister, I don't know where you got it from, but it was like you should write a speech so that an eight year old would understand it. And it doesn't matter who you're speaking to. You could be speaking to actuaries. Your language should still be that an eight-year-old could follow you. Because if we're speaking in highfalutin words, and there's one for you, big words, you see, now we all know what I'm talking about. <laughs> when we use big words and confusing words and jargon, we're going to lose people in the audience. So simple words, vivid words, where we're describing things clearly and in short sentences, you're not going to lose your audience. So it's about choosing your language intentionally to not come across that. And obviously, it's interesting when there's language divides, but then going, do I need to bring in the translation of this word for my audience? So that's filling in the gaps. That's what I was speaking about earlier. In terms of a story that the audience doesn't know, that's maybe the risk of telling stories that aren't our own. When you're telling your own story, they don't know the story, but they want to hear it. But if you're telling them, hey, guys, you know that fable about blah, blah, and they're going, no, now you've lost them. So sometimes it's either use something that's universal, like a fairy tale potentially, where you know most people in the audience would know it. But if you tell your own stories or your own experiences or experiences that everyone's had, like if you're talking about being stuck in traffic, there's... You're never going to find someone in an audience who doesn't know what you're talking about. So look for universal experiences that your audience have had and tell those stories to deliver your message. That's a great answer. So um, you can applause if you want to. <laughs> <laughs> She's a world champion after all. So um, we're getting a ton of questions from online and we, we are we, we're getting to the end of the session. So... Uh, I just want to shout out, I mean, we've got Michael Giza from Nice in France. Josephine was patching in from the Caribbean. Um, so we've got some great uh, audience members online uh, from around the world. Um, there's one question here that I wanted to just touch upon, um, which I think is just an I interesting question. When sharing devastating events, this is, by the way, from Claire Fenzel. Um, when sharing devastating events that led to major breakthroughs and transformation, how do we take an audience through this emotional journey of transformation without losing people? I guess when it's so personal, because you're talking about making it personal, right? But that, that's taking it an extra step. It's like, because it's so personal to you, how do you make it so that you don't lose your audience? I don't know, Mark, maybe you want to jump in there? Is that clear from Cell, you said? I think I know who Claire is. If it's the right person, Hola, hello Claire. to you, Claire. If not, hello anyway. Uh, yeah. You having, if I understand correctly, it's a heavy message, yeah. but you still want to have transformation. It, to me, it all comes back down to authenticity because when an audience knows the presenter is being authentic in his or, or their presentation, and they understand that sometimes the information being shared can be heavy. If the speaker is not perceived to be authentic and credible, then there's going to be a breakdown. They'll be, they'll, they'll, they'll be disconnected from the message. And as a presenter, if you're giving difficult news that you hope will lead to some kind of transformation, the audience has to know the why the news is delivered, what the consequence may have been, and they'll need solutions as to how we can get past this situation. And if I misunderstood the question, I apologize. But as a presenter, you, you always have to lead them along the path they need to be on based upon the information and the destination you want them to reach, which is a very great responsibility. Simply telling a story is not going to be enough. It's telling the story and concluding the story with the direction you want them to take, with the mindset you would like them to adopt, and hopefully with some hope at the end of this difficult season. If I've missed the question, I apologize. No, I think that's pretty, pretty spot on. Thank you, Mark. Uh, we've got a few more questions in the audience, um, but 
before we get to the audience, I have one question for you, Verity, because I watched your um, your recipe. And for those of you who are members of the platform, of the, the Heavy Chef platform, first of all, if you're not, please go and sign up. It's heavychef.com and sign up. Um, <laughs> and then um, uh, secondly, once you're on the platform, go and check out Verity's recipe on public speaking. It's really, really, really good, and it's been one of the the, the most watched recipes on the platform to date. Um, but one of the, the the learning bites, which I thought was really, really cool, you spoke about life force, and you spoke about this 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 thing that you you bring to the the presentation. So, what is this magical thing, <laughs> and how can we access it and use it ourselves? So life force I learned from my coach, Lance Miller. He was the 2005 world champion. And he has a, a formula for what touches your audience and what they remember. And 20% is the mechanics of your speech, how you've written it, your PowerPoint, the, you know, the way you've delivered it and all of that. 30% is your message. So you can have a badly structured speech with a great message. It's going to touch your audience. But 50% of what impacts them is your life force. And that for me is authenticity, it's passion, it's believing in what you're talking about. And you can actually, if you've got a life force and no message and no <laughs> structure, people might still vote for you because they're like, hell, yeah, yes, them, yes, fabulous. And everyone goes, what did they say? I don't know, but I love them. That's life force, you know, so we've got to be careful how we use it. And that's why we have to structure our communication so that our life force comes through. And one of the quickest ways to access life force is telling personal stories. And, and we always comment on this. You just go and watch people at a dinner party or at a braai after a few drinks, and they're telling a story about that time they missed a plane or something happened in the office, and they come to life. You put the same person on the stage, and they'll tell you the whole story like this, like completely monotone. But when they don't think anyone's watching, the life force is there. And it's that playfulness and that reliving an experience that your audience feels. And so you have to practice and create presentations that let your life force come through. If you're boring yourself while you're practicing your pitch, you're missing the life force. Go back and look at, can, can I change the content so that I can put myself in here? Yeah, I think that's extremely helpful for, for us. And that doesn't just apply, by the way, to public speaking, it also speaks to, you know, presenting your message or pitching for, uh, for investment or whatever it is. Bring your life force, because it is part of that thing which makes it so authentic and memorable, right? Um, we had a question at the back there. Uh, if you want to do the walk of fame. <laughs> and also, please introduce yourself <laughs> so that our actuaries at the back can consider you for the prize. <laughs> Hi, I'm Brendan. Um, I'm going to make a generalization and ask for a generalization in response. Um, when, I, when I still had a job and was working in the corporate sector and we'd bring Americans over into the UK institutions, I always felt that they were brilliant at presentations and they always sounded the most convincing. And I think we've been kind of Hollywood conditioned perhaps to the American accent. And so, and, and I do find the American accent maybe easier on the ear and easier to follow and listen to. Um, so what are your thoughts on the South African accent, which is maybe a little slower <laughs> and, and harder on the ear? And can we, uh, can we carry ourselves internationally? And if not, what, what do we need to do? Uh, thanks. What a great question. I'm so glad he asked that. <laughs> that is an amazing question. I'm just totally going to answer it like this and see if that works. <laughs> I'd love to hear from Mark, yeah, Mark because I've lived said. in America and they love our <laughs> accent, but I'd actually love it to hear from Mark, I have who's noticed, however, from they, Barbados. They, they, never, they never use the South African accent in movies, right? They always use Cause, Australian cause accent. Because they can't do or, it. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Listen to Leonardo in Blood Diamond. Mark, what are your accent? thoughts? Accent? What accent? I don't have, I don't have an accent, man. I'm, I'm just a regular Jamaican man. I don't have an accent. I sound like my friends. It's not a problem. The thing is, I always say this. Your accent is an asset. Don't lose it. Use it. I'll say it again. Your accent is an asset. Don't lose it. Use it. What I've learned is, and I, look, I have clearly modified my accent 
not only for this audience, but being a global speaker, South Korea, Saudi Arabia, Lithuania, Switzerland, I try to neutralize my accent somewhat. Okay, so when I'm with Jamaicans, I sound different. I get that. But there's always a hint of something Caribbean in my accent. It prompts my audience to lean in a little bit. That's a nice accent. And it almost makes them pay a bit closer attention. Do I try to sound so Jamaican to force them to listen? No, it's hard enough work being in Saudi Arabia with a Jamaican accent, speaking English to people who normally speak Arabic and slowing down to accommodate them. But I am proud of my Jamaican heritage. I will not deny it or, or hide it. And I believe with enough careful diction, my accent will still allow me to be heard, understood, and because I'm unique, it'll also allow me to be remembered. I don't make any effort to be American because American means different variations of accents. I live in Georgia in the South where they say y'all all the time. You know, I could go, to, I'm in New York, my name is Mark. Hey Mark, how you doing? Forget about it. You know, how you doing? Forget about it. If I go to Boston, it's Mac. Hey Mac, where's the cat? All right, so you, the accents are changed. But allow yourself, give yourself permission to be yourself and confidently yourself and bring yourself to your world, to your prospects, to your clients. Bring your whole being to every meeting, every presentation, every conference. And don't be afraid or ashamed of who you are. I say, be proud of who you are. If some skinny, not need buck teeth, Jamaican kid can be a world champion and travel the world then my friends in South Africa, so can you. I think that's an amazing place to, to end off. Guys, we've come to the end of our session tonight. Thank you to everybody online. Uh, we've got so many questions flooding in, and, and um, I just want to encourage everybody just to, um, just to well, sign up to Heavy Chef. Shameless punt, uh, but um, there is a lot of practical stuff that you can uh, you can access, particularly Verity's uh, recipe on um, on public speaking, and uh, and hopefully we're going to get Mark here to South Africa where we can also capture a recipe from him. Uh, ah. So this is an open invitation to you. We would love to host you here in person. And, wow, uh, I would love that, uh, Fred. I would have been I've been to SA twice, okay. and I have met Douglas Kruger and several individuals there. And I don't have a recipe to offer them on Heavy Chef, but I would encourage everyone who were who was interested in mastering public speaking to consider the Unforgettable Presentations podcast, where my partner Darren Lacroix, who I coached by the way to be the 2001 world champion. And I, every week, we interview speakers or we share wisdom that we've gained over the last 30 years on public speaking to help you develop that skill and eventually you'll present your own unforgettable presentation. Any platform, check us out. You might learn a thing or two. Fred, Am thanks. Amazing. We will put all the links on the, the show notes. We also email everybody in terms of the event report. Uh, I also encourage everybody to have a look at Verity's book at the back there. Buy a copy if you can. And, uh, and Verity, I'm sure, will we'll find the time to, to sign it this evening. Uh, that is, if she's not mobbed by, by um, fans after this. Just a, a, a last um, a word of thanks to our two speakers. First of all, congratulations for all the amazing work that you've done and the achievements that you've achieved and uh, can we just give our, our two guests amazing, warm round of applause. Thank you, guys. Um, and, <laughs> and I have a reminder from my team of actuaries at the back there that they have, uh, they have deduced who the, the winner is. And there, it was quite a tight one. Uh, by the looks of things, I see there's quite a lot of chatter on the, what's, uh, the WhatsApp feed. <laughs> so the uh, very official um, actuarial scientist uh, <laughs> process has revealed the message, accent guy with a question mark. <laughs> Brendan, I think his name was. <laughs> 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 well done to Brendan. 
Brendan, the accent guy, congratulations <laughs> on the prize. Uh, we have, you weren't supposed to come up, but you can. Here is, here, here, here is the prize. There you go. There you go. Congratulations, Brendan. And uh, there were a few people online who were close, close, close contenders, but uh, thank you everybody online for patching in. It was really great to see the chatter and all the comments and the, the questions. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Verity. Please, guys, stick around for a bit. Thank you to all our partners and to Workshop 17 for hosting us. And uh, talk amongst yourselves, get to know each other, interact. This is where the magic happens. Have a drink, buy a book, and come say hi. Thank you. <laughs>